In this interview, I meet up with Stacy Piercy, who is an entrepreneur, a homeschool parent, and director of entrepreneurial learning at GalileoXP.com. She has been teaching her own entrepreneurship program to kids as young as six since 2015. Stacy also hosts the popular Kids to Market podcast, which features young entrepreneurs from around the world. Let's welcome Stacy. Thank you so much for taking this time to be here. I wanted to ask you that you have three boys you chose to homeschool. How did that all start? And also, uh, um, I know that you're familiar with unschooling. Maybe you want to explain the difference to our viewers. Well, let's just start with how we got started. Okay. Um, we, uh, my young, oldest was in a, a charter school that focused on the arts for kindergarten. And it was a fantastic program. You know, I had two other babes in arms. So I had a toddler and a brand new baby when he started school. And he had a Montessori trained teacher and she was lovely, uh, super forgiving, very laid back, you know, so you couldn't have picked a better kindergarten, to be honest. And it was half days. And he hit about April and he didn't want to go anymore. He kind of had enough, you know, like he was finished. He didn't feel like doing it any longer. And so there was a lot of a lot of tearful drop-offs and a please don't make me stay or I'd have to stick around till he got comfortable back into the classroom was happy to stay for the day or for the you know the period of time that he need to be there and it was a considerable drive from our house as well um, that when he finally finished in June you know made tons of friends and had a great time he was uh, sort of excited that it was over and that he would never have to do that again. <laughs> I said, well, actually it starts again in the fall. Um, and this particular charter school actually only has six weeks of summer holidays. They actually start up mid August uh, because they give their teachers more professional days uh, to work on their own stuff. And so uh, when I explained to him, he had to go back. He said, well, if I had a break, maybe it'd be okay. I don't mind doing this. And I said, just do understand that it's full time. You have to go all day long. And he literally laid down in the parking lot and started crying, like right on the ground. So I said, okay, okay, okay. Let's just, we can talk about it. Just relax, you know. And when you're managing two other small children, you sort of go, okay, this is, this is, it's so much work. Uh, we're Canadian, as you know. So, uh, prairie winters are really hard and mm -hmm. you start projecting forward on all the driving and you know having to deal with toddlers through all of that because they have to come with me because my husband works full-time so um well we own our own business and so he can't I can't leave my kids at home with him that's for sure so if I had to you know go anywhere I have to take them with me and a large portion of our day was spent driving back and forth to this school because it was a solid 45 minute drive in both directions. So those two toddlers, the toddler and the baby are doing it twice. So they're spending four hours a day in a vehicle going back and forth. Yeah. So it was, uh, it wasn't hard. It wasn't a hard sell when I suggested to my husband, I'd always thought about homeschooling um, in part because of the experience that I had in middle school and in junior high. Uh, I left that experience and said, oh, if I were ever to homeschool, it would be these grades. You know, the teaching was amazing, but it was more the overall experience, um, not just peer influence, but what you were required to learn. Uh, we had a really great band program, so I was really lucky. But if I hadn't had that band program, it would have been, it would have just been a, a, a physical and intellectual and emotional struggle for me. And so I always thought, and, and the, the peer interaction sometimes was crazy. Like it just wasn't something I appreciated. Yeah, it's hard. So when I said to my husband, I think we could try homeschooling. You know, I've done a little bit of research. I don't think there's a whole lot to do when you homeschool grade one. So I don't think that I, I would wreck him if we chose to do this. And we can always go back the next year if it doesn't work. And he was all for it. He's not a fan of school. And so he just said, yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a try. And we seriously, uh, we didn't look back until our oldest said, I, I'd like to go to grade nine. I'd like to go because I'd like to do some team sports. And our philosophy of education about what it means to be educated and what it means to homeschool our kids is that ultimately it should be their choice. Yes. And so that, so if they want to go to school, that, that's their decision. It's where they learn best, where they're most comfortable, what, you know, how do they get 
the information that they need in the and the avenue and he he wanted to do that he wanted to go and and have that experience and so we fully supported it we had a really great local public school um for that junior high years and and it was it was good it was actually a really positive experience but that sort of lends into the question about unschooling uh about choice and about autonomy yeah. and so through a lot of reading and some personal experience even before i had kids I was aware of unschooling, but it was called something else. It was called child-led learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had the opportunity to teach in China after I finished uh, my first degree. And I went and spent some time there. And I think there was maybe three other people in amongst five million in my very small Chinese town in central China mm -hmm. that were there also teaching English. And one of them was a mom from California. And she mm -hmm. had a nine-year-old son. And he was child-led. And this kid was phenomenal. Um, and I tell this story to so many people because I think it's kind of, it's very illustrative of what unschooling is. Uh, so she had the freedom and the flexibility to take off. She'd go teach. Uh, he would come and sit in the classroom with her and actually even help her teach, but he could not read. Mm -hmm. He didn't do any form of math. He couldn't tell time on an analog watch. And she assured me that he'll get there when he gets there. Well, if you don't teach a child to read, how will they learn? If you don't sit them down and explain the concepts of math, then how do they get there? Mm -hmm. And I watched over the period of a year, this, this kid just could build mm -hmm. anything out of noodles or matchsticks, or they were these really weird plants that kind of grew outside the building and he would break off the stems and he would build these fantastic structures. And I don't mean like little ones, I'm talking like suspension bridges kind of structures. Oh. He was amazing. And he could speak Chinese almost instantaneously. Wow. So in China, you have a standard Chinese, which people like to call Mandarin, Mandarin, but they called it standard Chinese. And every single town, every single village, every single city has their own dialect. Mm -hmm. You know, to and yeah. he could he picked up multiple dialects mm -hmm. and was speaking within six months of us being there. He was beginning to translate for us because he would play with the neighborhood kids and he would learn to speak the languages. So it's it's clear that he's bright. Yep. So I became very fascinated by this. There, his mom was also a homeopath, which is, you know, an alternative uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent a lot of time with this family. So fast forward, I have my own kids. I've decided that I think we should try unschooling, which I'll explain in a minute. And uh, I caught up with her and I called her and said, so whatever came of Matt, you know, like with that whole story as a background, that's my only context of Matt. I left China before they did. I think they actually stayed for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. She said, well, you know, we've got a really large uh, child-led community in California, like hundreds strong. And we've noticed that somewhere around 12 or 13, they start looking for structure. Um, but they want to do something, be mentored by somebody else, take a class and Matt decided he was going to take an AutoCAD class and I still think he was a struggling reader and he'd never touched math ever. Mm -hmm. wow. And so he taught himself what he needed to be able to take this computer aided drafting and design, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, in a community college. So he was taking a college level class at like 13 years old. And I said, Oh, well, that's, I said, so where did he end up? He goes, Oh, well, he's got an honors degree in architecture. So it's an interesting transition it's um it's such a fantastic story to tell to people to say you don't have to do this in order for great things to happen i mean those are feel-good stories you know what happens to all of the unschoolers where they didn't do something like that and is being self-directed really helped them i can't tell you stories like that because i only really hear the good ones i haven't really come across that many unschoolers that haven't been uh, successful in their own definition. So what's the difference between homeschooling and unschooling? So homeschooling, uh, unschoolers are homeschoolers. So that's, they fall underneath that umbrella, but there's philosophies or approaches to homeschooling. There's school at home where you're following um, the government curriculum and you are being heavily supervised, possibly in a regulated environment to make sure that you're meeting those standards. You're possibly even having those things marked by somebody else. Yeah. And then you go to what I would call a traditional homeschooler where you uh, pick and choose curriculum that suits your needs at grade level. So you're doing English language arts, you're doing social studies, you're doing science, um, you're doing a math curriculum. Uh, sometimes you would find tutors or you just sort of, you, you put it together. Yes. You become sort of this hub, this central individual. 
Uh, then there's eclectic homeschoolers, which I'll actually talk about afterwards. Uh, and then I find that there's self-directed learners where we call them unschoolers. Uh, some people call them autonomous learners or child-led learners, where the child actually gets to decide what they learn, when they learn, and how they learn it. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that as a parent? Um, yes. It's almost like a management approach, right? You learn to lead from behind. Yes. And when they express an interest in something, you start to provide resources for that when they're young, okay. right? You yep. put things in front of them sometimes that they might be interested in, but they're not required to open anything or write anything down. There's no coercive teaching. Mm -hmm. There's no rote learning. Um, you'll find that their learning is, happens in disparate leaps, right? So they'll just be totally engaged in anything to do with mathematics or anything to do with science and then math happens by proxy or mm. they're heavy, heavy readers. You see that in a lot of child-led learners. And so they learn to write by active reading and then they find that they're starting to write their own stories. And so nice. you don't have to say you have to do it. You just allow them to explore their world and their life. And child-led learners or unschoolers believe that kids are learning all the time. Yes. In every opportunity, every moment, every interaction that you have, they are actually learning. So the original person who I think, I don't know if he coined the term, but he definitely was sort of what we call the father of unschooling is John Holt. Okay. Um, and you can put that in your show notes and tell people to, to go and take a look at it. But there's been many, many since then. Um, and so the whole idea is that the reason why children learn is because they have a natural curiosity to want to learn. And he wrote a book, How Do Children Learn? He wrote one on how children fail as well. Mm -hmm. And it lays this foundation to say that you don't have to put these things in front of them. They'll get there when they need it and in time for when it's useful. Yes. And so I've come across this a lot in my own research and my own experience and my own conversations with people who wouldn't even define themselves as unschoolers. Like say they chose um, uh, entrepreneurship and uh, they chose not to go the college route. We know many, many entrepreneurs drop out of college. Yeah. You know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, you know, like, I mean, yeah. there's tons because they fake it till they make it kind of thing. And yes. this is unschooling is almost like this in the sense that they're going, well, I needed to take this AutoCAD class and I need to read better. So he worked really hard to improve his reading level and he had to have some definite geometric math. He had to have al algorithmic math. There was things in there that he needed. Uh, she said, then he's discovering while well, he's doing the algebra for the AutoCAD that it'd be much easier if he had memorized his multiplication tables so that his algebra goes easier and faster. So then that happens on the side. He looks for an app where he can wow. like, you know, power learn what it is that he needs to do, but he's never touched upon trigonometry because he does not need it. Yes. for what he's doing. So we don't believe that we need to learn everything for all possible futures. Yes, exactly. They can entirely be by their interest. If they never touch biological sciences, that's okay for an unschooler because it doesn't have context and it isn't necessary. But have they never come across biological science? Oh, of course they have. Like one of my favorite stories is finding an owl pellet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I brought it home and it smells really bad, by the way, and they start to rip it apart. And now we're having to do anatomy and skeletal structures and guess what the kind of animal is. And it just becomes very hands-on learning. Yes. But then there'll be months and months and months where, yeah, we don't touch science at all. All yes. we're doing is literature. Maybe it's because we're, you know, binge watching really amazing you know, theater to movie reenactments on Netflix or something. And then we have conversations about the impact of Shakespeare on our culture and on our language. I didn't have to show them Shakespeare. They found it hmm. as just part of living life. So yes, that makes sense. probably in a nutshell. It, it <laughs> does make sense. Is. And I, while you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, you know, a lot of the time, we are educating kids, but there's no internal motivation. Everything you said was all driven internally, right? You know, and then it's led by them. Like, absolutely. It's like, it's amazing. That it becomes intrinsic, right? So yeah. that's the whole point, which relates back to that sort of entrepreneurship sort of yes. idea. Is that, yes. You know, em 
you don't want to be an employee because that means you just have a job and you're getting paid. But when you're an entrepreneur, you don't get paid. But there is this, so then why would you do it if you're not making any money personally? There is a motivation behind it. It has this sort of end goal. It has an interest. It has a vision. Exactly. You know, it's the possibilities going forward or the potential of that business that drives you forward. And for unschooled children that are self-directed and autonomous and Ultimately, the key to unschooling is those children are given choice. Exactly. They have empowerment. And in our society, children have no purpose. I know. They don't exactly. exist for any reason. And so when you give them that kind of control and power over their own lives, that motivation jumps significantly. If you're pulling them from school or moving from traditional homeschooling to unschooling, we have this period of time called de-schooling yeah. where you just need to leave them be. And it could take two months, it could take two years for them to unpack and slough off the, I need a grade, I need a gold star, I need positive reinforcement, I need somebody to structure my day. You know, beautiful creativity is born out of I'm bored. So yes. you have, there's this time period where if they've already have a construct of what schooling should look like, moving to unschooling will feel almost scary especially for parents yes you know i i hear so many times but if i did that my kid would play video games all day yeah that's all they would do and my response is so do a little bit of research because you'll discover there's an incredible amount of learning and enrichment in playing video games yes. there's a lot that they get from that well they would just spend all day online with his friends and exactly why is that a problem? Because they're interacting and they're socializing and they're working collaboratively in groups. There is a lot, a lot to be learned from playing video games. More importantly, back to that point of feeling valued or having a contributing factor in society and in our economy, kids don't feel that. And in video games, they do. Mm -hmm. They actually are valued and they are necessary and they feel success. Yes. And so it actually tends to bring their self-esteem up. Esteem up. You know, every parent's got to make that decision for themselves, but I have not seen, and I have three very different personalities in my house, including a child with ADHD. Hmm. And so when I watch them and I give them that full autonomy and that full control over their life, it's amazing the nature of their personality and interaction with me and how it changes. So it has it a lot out. of positive outcomes. How it comes out of you know, for two. And I wanted to ask you, like, um, when you started, was it scary? Like, as you mentioned earlier, for a lot of yeah. parents right now thinking about this, it's a, it's a lot of doubts, right? You must have gone through, I know you, you said your husband supported it. He didn't have a problem. But as far as uh, you, you had, a, I think that experience in China probably showed you, like it was living proof to you, right? It works. I mean, it's working, right? But uh, I'm, I'm sure you did a lot of research, like for parents who are like after COVID, right? They're thinking, a lot of them are thinking of, you know, I have done some schooling at home, but it's not necessarily their, their it wasn't a, their choice. It was something we had to do, right? Now right. they're thinking that it kind of worked for us. Now, should I continue this or should I send them back, right? So that's where they're, you know, kind of in the position right now for parents. So what, what kind of advice would you say for parents in that mindset right now? Like, should I send them or should I keep them? Like, what, what would, it, it, you know, make that decision easier? I, I think, yeah, that's not an easy decision. Yeah. Like, I think that that's actually a really tricky decision. Yeah. Um, with relation to, uh, I'll go back to the first question of, was it scary to switch to unschooling? Yeah. Um, I switched there pretty quickly, so it wasn't that hard. Uh, we were also in a homeschool co-op, so they were getting uh, time with other teachers uh, mm -hmm. as well. So although our personal philosophy said, you know, we're not going to teach them anything, they were in a program with other kids learning something, but they had full right of re refusal. They didn't have to participate in that program. And, mm -hmm. and they did, despite it actually had some pretty traditional schooling aspects to it. I mean, they had math or, you know, they had no homework, but they definitely had assignments that they were completing. So is it scary? I, I think that you, with any change, you need to arm yourself with information. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty about self-directed learning online. Um, there is actually a movie, uh, Jeremy Stewart's done too, Class Dismissed, uh, which was a, 
a family going through that exact transition. Okay. Uh, they decided to leave school and then they tried all these different styles of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually a really good, a really good movie because you watch that transition. Mm -hmm. And then recently he just released Self-Directed and he's following adults who were unschooled mm -hmm. and how that impacted their future. Uh, so both are, there's, there are a lot, there are plenty of books. Blake Bowles is a really good resource um, for unschooling. And he just finished writing a book called, uh, Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? So for those parents that are wondering whether or not I should transition, there is a, an incredible amount of literature out there to help them decide which or the other. So what they're experiencing right now for COVID is not homeschooling. That's online learning, which is an entirely different thing uh, from homeschooling. And whether or not to make this decision is really up to the parents. Now, I always say that children have a choice and they have control, but I, as the parent, am willing to allow that to happen, right? So if you need to work two jobs and, you know, or you're dual income family, or you struggle with um, uh, maybe spending too much time with your children, because that is a thing, you know, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, if you struggle with family pressure uh, in order to educate your child this way or that way, um, if you're in a situation of child custody and divorce, I mean, these are all very legitimate issues. And there is no absolute right way to educate a child. And there have been actual studies that have suggested that they all turn out pretty close to the same. The education model is not as impactful as parenting. Mm. So as a parent, you have to decide if you wanna embrace this and you can switch. So if you decide after one year of giving this a try, of homeschooling, this doesn't work for you, most public education models out there say that those that allow for homeschooling, that they can re-enter in at their grade level. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't turn them away. That's the whole point of public education. So they can, and they will not fall behind. That would be my other piece of advice is that they won't. Um, you might get some bias. They might be low grades in the beginning of the year when they go back. I mean, my 14 year old started grade nine, having never sat in a classroom. And he started with, I think barely 50%. Uh, he was passing everything. And they were fully aware that he was originally homeschooled. And I said, mm -hmm. we'll figure it out and he'll figure it out. And by the end of the year, um, he was, um, mm -hmm. achieving, uh, top grades. So nice they get there because they, like I said, they learn it in time. They learn it when they need it sort of idea. So the advice that I would have is they have to do some searching internally and personally on whether or not they want to take this challenge on. Yes. Some people find homeschooling very hard. Some people find it very easy because it's based philosophically in how you define education and being educated, which is mm -hmm. different from being schooled. Yes. So what does it mean to have an education? And if you can, do a little bit of research over the summer and make sure that you understand how you want to approach it. Um, I get a lot of uh, emails from new homeschoolers who have decided they're going to do it this way. Like you said, they have a curriculum. And then I get questions halfway through the year of all it is is tears and fighting. All I'm doing is fighting with them constantly to get them to do their schoolwork. And, you know, that's when I say suggest that then just let it go for a little bit because they're not going to fall behind in that time. And I got it during uh, the pandemic as well. There's yes. all this work coming from the teacher and they don't want to do it. And I said, then your first place is to talk to the teacher and ask, is this genuinely necessary because it's causing relationship breakdown in the family and your relationship is the most important thing you have with your kids, yeah. not whether or not you provide an education for them. It's yes your interaction, your relationship with them. So if this is going to challenge that relationship, I suggest you find alternatives. And there are, other than homeschool, there are all alternative schooling options mm -hmm. out there if public school isn't where you want to send them back to. Yep. But I, I suggest jumping off with both feet, but don't ever do anything that is going to challenge or compromise that relationship. Yep. Like I said, I have an ADHD child and sitting down and doing physical book work at a desk is actually very painful for him. It's very stressful. And so at any time that I've ever pushed that, and I did for a short period of time because he didn't learn to read till he was 11. Mm. And I thought that 
it was okay for eight and it's okay for nine and it's okay for 10, but 11 starting to get kind of crazy as we're sort of approaching puberty and we're sort of, you know, kind of going into that. So, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. Yes. I, I say that I'm an unschooler and yes, we follow along that line, but it's easy to be an unschooler with a really self-motivated child. So if you have a child that isn't self-motivated and they don't look like they're doing what you think the benchmark of where you think that they should be, even the best unschoolers will fall off the wagon a little bit and go, well, you know, maybe it's, maybe he can't learn to read because he needs help. Yes. So then you go through that whole process of going, is there a learning disability? Is there an issue that I just need to be more supportive and more supplementary? And that it backfired on me completely. It's not what mm -hmm. he needed. He was just developmentally not ready to read. Mm -hmm. And it challenged our relationship for a while. Yeah. He actually said to me at one point, he goes, you know, mom, I'm just tired of being wrong because he's they start to compare themselves to others or they're not meeting expectations or so just keep the relationship intact go ahead and give it a try it's not written in stone you yeah. know you can try something else and do do your research do some reading get on some homeschool yeah. blogs um if you're a, a religious uh homeschooler that gives you an opportunity to spend more time on that in a more positive way yeah. um so i meet, meet a lot of a lot of religious homeschoolers um if you're a secular homeschooler, uh, you can pick and choose the curriculum you want. So even from a science standpoint as a homeschooler, if you decide you don't, um, you know, well, I can't even think of an example off the top of my head. If you don't want to deal with lasers, then don't deal with lasers. Or mm -hmm. our, our social studies curriculum has Peru and Tunisia and Ukraine for grade four. Mm -hmm. But that's okay if they're at that grade four age and you decide you want to do India and China and Japan go crazy it yes. you'll get there eventually they'll come across those things because we learn all the time but even as a traditional homeschooler understand that if you're enriching their life with all of those things if it's important to have those three r's you know reading writing arithmetic then do that do yes. it but the amount of time you need to spend doing it is nowhere near as much time as they spend in school it's very very small in comparison yeah. so don't create busy work just get it done and if they got the concept then move on mm -hmm. and if they're having a math day and they want to spend all day on math then let them burn through 14 units go crazy the best part about homeschooling is the flexibility it provides you and your children to sort of dictate the day right yeah. or even the week yeah. Maybe today we're not going to homeschool. We're, we're going to go hiking, nice. which to me is actually homeschooling. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you learn a lot. For sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one other question I want to ask before we move on to the next one is you said your son went to high school, right? How was it for him in, in terms of peers, like mixing in socially? I know. He yeah. Did. So there's a myth about homeschooling that we are not socialized because we are, and my kids have peer groups. Um, we have homeschool co-ops. Uh, they're on teams. So yeah, it, it's not something to worry about. They don't, I don't worry about it. Yeah. It's because if I thought they had socialization issues to the point where it was um, a developmental or psychological problem, then it would be, that's a different topic. And even school kids have that problem. Right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Homeschoolers don't have an issue with that because they're human beings in the world like anybody else. They yeah. don't have problems with that. Now, they, we socialize and we multi-age socialize, so they're very comfortable talking to adults, whereas lots of school kids aren't. No. So they just, they have a question or they have an issue, you know, they don't, they don't fear authority because yeah. it's not something they've ever had to fear. So they just, yeah, he had no issues. He awesome. didn't have any issues. Yeah, it awesome. wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. And he went into a program of choice, like a specialty program that was Olympic sports. And mm -hmm. so he got to do really unique things like bobsleigh and skeleton and nice. velodrome cycling and, you know, Olympic wrestling and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's, you have like peers come together around a common interest. Yes. And so if your kids are, you know, coming from homeschooling into high school, then you know, usually it's because they're after something that homeschooling can't provide them. You band, mechanics, construction, athletics, you know, a really stellar art program, broadcasting, photography, something. It's doing yeah. it's something else. It's rarely because they want to take AP math. No. <laughs> <laughs> there are some. Well, robotics, you know, uh, computer science. Like if they, you've got a public school that's got some really neat um, alternative programs in it, then I can see where the appeal is. And yeah, by all means, go. That yeah. works for you. 
perfect. Um, I wanted to ask you, you are, a, you are the founder of the Kids to Market. How did you come to that idea? Like, it's an amazing idea. This is where you said even young as six-year-old can start their own business. Yeah, so that's a part of being a homeschooler. So yeah. we had uh, our homeschool community had a co-op. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is parents take on different opportunities to teach and kids can sign up. So if you've got, you know, a background in puppetry or you've got a background in dance or you're really good at um, Lego robotics or whatever, and we would hold classes, you know, five, five Fridays a semester. So like 10 times a year. And I taught quite a few things in that in that mm -hmm. co-op and then I started running the co-op and I couldn't find a teacher actually to mm -hmm. teach I you know their parents were busy at that time and so instead of not running it uh, I said uh, you know what would be fun is we should have a children's business fair mm -hmm. I saw this at this other school and I thought that was really cool why don't we hold like a market fair mm -hmm. and they thought that was the school at uh, the group um, the homeschool group said geez, that would be fun. And can we invite other people? And someone actually said, my kid wouldn't know the first thing about starting a business. So I was like, well, I can teach that. I've mm -hmm. been starting and dissolving and running businesses for over 20 years. I can totally, I actually had no idea. I had no idea if it was going to work. So they said, oh, could you do it with like the really young ones? And I went, sure. You know, the teens weren't available because they were already engaged in a program and had a teacher for their program. And so mm -hmm. I don't know, it, it, it could have gone really badly and uh, it didn't that first day when I taught that very first class. So I had three classes of somewhere between 15 and 25 kids each. And I started with ideation and uh, they snapped that right up. They got it right away. The next week they came back with prototypes and were ready to pitch and we're getting into cost analysis and pricing models. And yeah, it was hard. There's a lot of things I dropped after that first experience of teaching mm. things where like I had them fill out a business plan, which is strange as an unschooler that I would offer something like that to a group of homeschoolers, but not everybody in the group was uh, unschoolers. My entrepreneur brain took over. To be honest, as an entrepreneur, I've never written a business plan. Mm. I don't find any value in them because I don't go after funding mm. yeah. when I build businesses, right? So I'm self-funded. Mm. Um, but I morphed and changed and manipulated over probably about four years, the content and the curriculum and it got more and more popular and other homeschool communities started asking me to teach. So I started teaching for them. And then this last fall, um, people well outside my comfortable driving range to teach this class, you know, over five Fridays, um, was it going to work? So I created an online course, okay, nice. uh, called kids to market. So I mm -hmm. launched a business and incorporated and, you know, started all up and I, I sort of did my, pre-launch uh, in the fall and launched the online course just as COVID-19 hit. Nice. <laughs> so Perfect. in some ways it was really good because people were looking for online experiences, but um, one of the key aspects, the online learning was supposed to help supplement the in-person stuff as well as um, impress upon them the importance of running a children's business fair. And of course with the pandemic, that's been really challenging. So um, it's been going very well, but yeah, the youngest, the younger ones actually make really outstanding, business. you know, business owners. Yeah, no. they, they, they get it because there's no editor and no filter telling them they can't. Yes. The sky's the limit. You know, yes. I had one little girl say, I want to make pants for unicorns. And I'm like, right on. I can't wait to see that. You yeah. know, nice. you don't put any boundaries on them. You give them a green field. She, she was talking about something entirely different. I don't know if it was clothing for stuffed animals, but I didn't tell her she couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She yeah. just created the market creates its own boundaries yes. right so, so yeah that's that's the brainchild that's how that kind of uh sparked all of that was i tried it on a group of homeschools and it was homeschoolers and it went really well <laughs> and you you got this um idea i guess also i mean you're in the homeschool you needed you know to bring them all together it's an activity it's good activity to bring them together but also you talked about how um defining success and pr preparing children for future employment yeah. right? it's yeah. a big thing because we don't have connection i think there's a big gap between what you learn and what you do in the later in life and because of that gap is why many students that i you know encounter have asked asked me like why am i learning this where what are you going to do with this right yeah i mean i, I think your program this this uh, you, you bridged that to, you know can you explain about like probably that's where you got 
got into it too, right? Your idea. Yeah, well, it's the, the conversation sort of ensued about there are these invisible skills. Some people call them soft skills. Some people call them 21st century skills. It's like how I was asked mentoring many homeschoolers over the years that how do I know if my child will be successful? I said, well, there's lots that goes into that. I mean, you're looking for perseverance. You're looking for self-direction. You're looking for independence, resiliency, um, creativity, critical thinking. That's a big one. Uh, creative problem solving. And they're like, yes, but how are they doing that? I mean, even if I did a standard curriculum, I can see some critical thinking. You know, everybody likes Lego. I go back to video games because that actually helps. But mm -hmm. how are we really preparing our children? And homeschoolers always worry that they're wrecking their kids. Yes. It's a constant conversation around the, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. I'm going to end up with this, you know, 37 year old, you know, know video gamer with a graphic tee and a neck beard living in my basement and he's never going to leave. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, you hear this, these anxieties about, um, are they going to be able to compete? Yes. especially the, can they get into college, which is, uh, it's an interesting thing because my argument is, do they have to go? It depends on what they want to do. But yes, even college success is very dependent upon those skills. But if we talk about how do we build in our children um, that sort of entrepreneurial mindset so that they have the flexibility in the way that they roll with the next thing that comes at them, because there are jobs in the future that we don't even know exists yet. I mean, when I was, when you and I were teenagers, social media manager did not exist. And yet that actually is a very lucrative role. Um, and as well as independent business that you can create, there are a lot of things that are going to come at them that school can't prepare them for because they just don't know they're there yet. Yes. So if they have this foundational, these foundational skills to move forward in their life, if we can build those things just into them intrinsically, and I don't believe that they actually can be taught. They have to be experienced. Perseverance is grit and it comes with falling down and getting up again. It's failure and retry and failure and retry. And the more open-ended that failure and retry becomes, the better the perseverance. And the fact that failure doesn't become a, a personal moniker. It's not, I'm a failure, it's I have failed. And it's a very different mindset, a very different internal conversation that occurs. So could you go, you know, get it learning to play an instrument? Absolutely. There's some of it, but you're not going to get a lot of critical thinking, you know, um, or problem solving, probably some resilience and definitely perseverance. I mean, it's very hard to learn how to play that. Um, if they're working through a mathematical problem, yes, but then there isn't the intrinsic motivation to do it because there's an end success. So when you build a business, you actually get all of that. Yes. You get all of those things rolled into one. Oh my gosh, you're going to fail. You're going to fail a lot, yes. right? <laughs> you know, the, the path to success is paved in failure. So that happens. So the resiliency and perseverance piece is definitely there. Um, and perseverance comes with setting an accountable deadline to somebody else. Yeah. Right. That also comes with sort of that stick to itiveness, which is the grit that kind of comes in. Um, the other aspect they get is about having to think creatively. What kind of problem or value are you solving for somebody else? When you have to come up with a business idea, there's an incredible amount of uh, creative problem solving that goes on. And then you move into that critical thinking. You've got a brand new business idea. Now you've got a prototype and now you've got to go through that whole lean startup methodology, right? You've got to, rethink the problem and test it on people and then come back at it and evaluate the feedback and then come back into the loop again and say, do I need to slightly change the prototype? Am I answering the call of someone's needs or did I make it with assumptions based in the marketplace? Yeah. So when you have to go through that, that's why I said you don't have to put boundaries around children learning to build a business because the market does it. Yeah. The market does it for them. And they learn all of these things. They learn how to fail and get back up. They learn how to persevere because they really want to make some money since that's ultimately the goal. Um, they learn how to cooperate with others. They learn when they can't do something that they look for resources in order to support themselves. They research things. They're creative and they definitely go through that critical thinking loop constantly, constantly. And it has an immediate reward. Yep. So the motivation is there. 
Money is a very, very good motivator. It's not the only motivator and it's not the best motivator, but it's a pretty good one. They discover along the way that money wasn't the point. Yeah, no. It was the fact that they created something with their own hands or came up with their own idea and other people wanted it. And we come back to that, the point of children in our society and our economy, it gives these kids an opportunity as young as six to feel value and to feel like they're contributing. So I just, I watched this transformative effect year after year, you know, the kid that talks into his armpit and is super shy and won't do math with mom. And I see them in a business fair and they're standing up tall and they're smiling. They're originally shy, but now you can't shut them up. You know, they're just ear to ear grin. And I get things like, I didn't think anybody would buy it. And wow, I really wish I would have made more so I could have made more money. And I'm so excited. I just want to give all my money away. They have this like fantastic superpower now. So they want to donate all of their money and, or they take their money and they buy everybody else's business at the business fair, which is fantastic. So they're supporting their community. Yeah. Uh, I just, I've never seen one homeschool project in 10 years of homeschooling and watching my children go through public school. And they're like the older one is I've never seen a project just do such a holistically fantastic job of all those things, all those skills that we want children to learn. Learn. So that was, that's my motivation. That's, you know, that's the why to my how is the, I I just, I can't get over how transformative this experience is. And I I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. When I read it, it was, it, it sounds like a holistic experience for the child for sure, you know, and seeing, And, and and so much of it is like um it's the unknown right you're you're taking the unknowns away from them and also understanding the whole world around them because they don't really get how a supermarket works now yeah. they go in they get it there must be a markup here what am i paying right all these Absolutely. things it's like they're calculating before they're just randomly just walking aimlessly in a supermarket now their brain is turning about all and that's with everything right that's actually part of the class like one of the assignments is i want you to go to the store and i want you to find the marketing I want you to find the call to action. I want you to find where they're kind of roping you in and pulling you in on that. So they understand marketing. And I want you to take a look at the price. And what do you think the value is compared to the price? Is that a cost plus model? Is it a value plus model in comparison? And they come back so excited that they understand this environment. And building a business is, it's like Christmas, right? So I call it the power of anticipation. Yes. The power of not yet. I've heard a, a, a doctor uh, talk about it in, in a TED talk because she advocates gradeless schools. Yeah. So instead of they going, you know, you got 80%, you got 90%, you got 60%. If it's below perfect, you get the mark you get on the paper is close, but not yet. Yes. Like that's the feedback these kids get instead of the you're only 60% good. good. Yeah. You're only 40% worth it is that they get this power of not yet. And you get that when you build a business because you don't know if anybody's going to buy it. So if you build forward to that, you know, I think the best part about uh, an anticipatory event where you're really excited about it, it's not likely the event that's the best part. It's the build up before the event. Yeah. You know, like Christmas, because that's my context, right? Yeah. But other cultures have similar events where we get really excited. Yeah. And it's the moment it's all over. but the build up to getting married is the best part. More than the day of it. Yes. More than the day of it for sure. Yep. Um, do you think some parents might think that uh, as young as six might be too early to introduce money? Like, you know how we're a society you know, our currency is money. Everything is based on that. And in school, the currency is great, which is actually bad, but that's how we are. Right. But yeah. um, do you think some, some people have a reservation about introducing the money concept to a young child at six? So that was the very first um, uh, obstacle or opposition to the idea in the first home uh, homeschool co-op um, because I had done some research on some other children's business fairs and said, mm-hmm. you know, so-and-so sold a what's it and she made $400. And I had a parent um, put up her hand in the meeting and say, I, have, I am very uncomfortable with my six-year-old having four to $600 to just mm-hmm. do whatever she wants with. And because I do make the suggestion to parents that they don't put limits around how the child spends the money because it is their money and they made it. And if they want to spend it all on gummy bears, 
me, that's a bad example because some people put restrictions on candy. I get that. But you know, if it's, if what's what they want to do with it, because it's part of the course, well, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to reinvest it? Or was it, did you make money for a particular goal? And now that you've made that, you're not going to keep your business up because you could buy that Xbox or you could buy that new BMX bike, you know, whatever it was. But if we have to, we have to give them the autonomy and control over that decision-making process or it just becomes another school project project. Yeah. They don't get to keep the money. What was the point? Yes. Why would they bother? You yeah. know, they won't have that internal motivation. And so what have I experienced in really young kids? The younger ones are more successful at reinvesting in their business idea because they mm -hmm. want to make more money. Mm -hmm. So um, the older, the middle school ones have a goal. You know, mom has said, you know, no to this toy or that toy. And as soon as they make that money. Um, but overall, interestingly enough, uh, most kids actually are looking to build a social enterprise, which is where uh, the business goes to help a charity or a cause uh, that they're passionate about. And so I don't, I'm not too concerned about it, even if it goes through one cycle. You know, if a child puts up a lemonade stand, are you worried about the money that they're going to make there? Or do you go, well, great, now you can go down to the store and ironically buy a Slurpee instead of the lemonade you were making, because that's actually essentially what they do with it. <laughs> and it's, I think that the value of as young as they possibly can understanding economy and how money works, I made that money, I worked really hard for that money, and is this item I'm going to buy worth that hard work that's in my hands. And when we give children money, they don't learn that. They don't, you know, it's a, it's the same thing with saying, well, I pay my kid to do chores. Nothing wrong with that. If you're going to pay your child to do chores, I don't, you know, I'm kind of hardcore. Don't do the chores because I'm an unschooler. But every once in a while I put my hand and say, I could use some help and I never get grief about that. Mm -hmm. ever my kids will help me whenever I need it but I'm not paying you to do a chore you live here yes. so if you know you want it to be clean then you can clean it I I just uh, I don't think I need to pay you for it so that's my own parenting philosophy but I know lots that pay them and I said okay the difference between starting your own business and being paid for chores is you just created an employee mm -hmm. they are not doing the chore because they want to clean the toilet they're doing it because they get paid for it, like any other employee in our economy right now. And does that build those skills, you know, they need to learn that they need to be paid for doing a job well done or doing hard work. There's nothing wrong with that learning, but that is not going to prepare them for a future they don't know because they'll wait for somebody to tell them what job to do. They won't like the job. They get the money for the job and then they run, right? Yeah. And so that's an employee mindset and that's the difference, the difference between an employee mindset and an entrepreneurial mindset. And so really, really young kids actually pick this up Quickly. extremely fast. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, they, and they grasp this concept. Ah, she, wait a second, that's my money. And I actually worked really hard for that. Yeah. And I either want to make more money or I want to save it, or I'd really like to give it to my church, or I'd really like to give it to the SPCA, or, you know, I want to give it to the homeless shelter that's downtown. You know, there's, there's tons of different versions of what kids want to do with their money. And in the beginning, they're going to voice a lot of consumerism, but mm. their view of consumer behavior changes very significantly wow. when they have to sell to somebody else and receive money. Wow. So now their behavior as a consumer begins to change. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I hear it a lot. I was going to buy that, but it's made of plastic and I don't think they did a very good job of it. Okay. I didn't really enjoy the quality of that product, which I thought I wanted. And now I don't see value in it. So I, I don't, I don't think it's, you can't teach this too young, you know? No, I don't you know. You know, uh, when children are given, they're not really learning anyway, right? Like if we just keep buying them or providing them, but you're showing them how it's done actually yeah Where do yeah. I, how do i work like how hard is it to work right so it's actually yeah. a valuable skill and and most kids if they get their first job they're always calculating like my uh, my stepdaughter when she got her first job she's calculating if i work next to this many hours this many months how many am i going to have in my bank account you know it's not she wasn't thinking about oh I'm, let me just go buy stuff but there was that saving yeah in them as the younger they are there's a lot of saving in them too so I'm, I'm, i think it's actually a great project to start and you know and, and and getting people off of this employee mindset is so important right because we don't get that a lot in our school system 
We're no, too. and it, there's nothing wrong with service industry. Oh, like yes. they're so important. I mean, yeah. We just can't function as a society without them. But there is no reason why you can't apply a, an entrepreneurial mindset to a service-based job. Yes. Right? You see opportunity. That's what it begins to teach you. And if you can start teaching them really young to see opportunities when they present themselves, you actually are a better employee as a result. Yeah. You can see deficiencies, you can see inaccuracies, you can see waste of time, you can see redundancies. This is just because you're looking at it from an entrepreneurial perspective to say, well, that's not efficient, or we could do better, we could make more, we can, we can serve more people if we were just change the design of the way that we do this. And so it's that design thinking as well that kind of comes into it, that engineering cycle that goes into the brain. So it's if you start learning and thinking with that with that enterprising notion, yes. that even if you end up being a you're, you're a nurse or you're a, you're a teacher or you're a frontline worker of any kind, I mean it is clear how unbelievably essential they have been in the last few months. So yeah. it's important. It'll it's the ones that were enterprising in their jobs that were successful that kept themselves healthy and and were essential for those of us who rely upon them so heavily yes. so i don't want to discount the value of those roles in society um, they're definitely very very important but you can approach those you can approach jobs and employee positions with an entrepreneurial mindset especially when you understand is it worth my time to do this job for the yes. amount of money that i'm being paid and one of the most significant outcomes from an entrepreneurial perspective is to say, how can I change this to be more rewarding, to be less work by improving the design where they can reduce the number of employees and maybe I can get paid more. So there's mm -hmm. lots of different ways that you can make use of this skill set in, in any, any role that you take on. Yes. And this project you have also brings the social component, right? In the homeschoolers, you know, they're coming together at this fair before COVID. You guys brought it together. Yeah. They state. don't really interact at the fair, to be honest. Um, but still, they get to see the others. Yeah, they do get to see other businesses. Yeah, like I said before, I don't worry about socialization for home homeschoolers. That's a misnomer. It's a it's an incredibly yes. overarching myth, myth that we we don't socialize. My kids have got an incredible group of friends, and they have lots of projects that they do with other people. Um, what I find is beneficial, yeah, because a lot of the children's business fairs I invite other than homeschoolers, right? So. Yeah, it's uh, I guess the best benefit would be if you actually are mixing um, educational approaches into a business fair, if you put one on, because it's very easy to put on a children's business fair. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps the community at large see that homeschoolers are no different than their own kids that are going to school. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So I think it changes public perception. I think that's probably the best benefit they don't if they don't know each other i mean they'll go and buy each other's businesses just like any market any farmer's market but they don't really interact at a at a business fair i i think it's more it's more community it builds better community overall even from a parenting standpoint that's for sure yeah thank you so much uh, before we leave i just have to ask you one thing so a person who's thinking a parent who's thinking right now about homeschooling your idea you told me earlier is that just just make it feel right for you before you start. And then, you know, what, what would you like to leave them with? What's your advice, the last piece of advice? Don't stress out about it so much, right? You know, if you, if you mess up for a couple of months or you don't think that was the right approach, um, try something different and yeah. start again. And you're not gonna wreck your kids. They're, they're gonna do just great because, you know, those of us that are unschoolers are proof because we don't do anything in order to facilitate that learning and they learn beautifully and they learn really well. So if you're going to do a, a, a structured homeschool program, just take it easy, take it slow, do what works. If it worked here, try that again, let go of the things that don't work um, and be willing to, to, you know, to switch gears because the, the mantra in any homeschool is that it, it's working or not working for now and it's going to change you're going to have this beautiful system going and then it's going to stop working for some reason developmental changes or family dynamic or whatever it is 
but make sure you really want to homeschool before you jump into this and that you're willing to take the time, the research and reach out and talk to other homeschoolers so you can get different points of view because everybody has an opinion on this. Yes. So make sure you embrace yourself and wrap yourself in uh, different ideas and give it a try and don't take it too seriously. <laughs> And you shared some really good resources for them to even movies and books and a lot of resources out there that they yeah. should be educating themselves and learning before, you know, starting thinking of it, jumping into yes. it. But exactly. It's okay if you don't do well first time, like it, it's okay. You can change. Keep changing. Yeah, that's right. Switch it. Do something different. Do structure, do unstructured, do eclectic, do unit studies, do project-based learning. Perfect. Give it a try. Try it on. That's like hats. Yes. You know, just keep switching hats until you find the one that fits nice. Yes. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you so much for coming and talking to me today. Thank you, Stacy. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much.